Typical ALS is pretty easy uh, to diagnose. Around the edges, there's some problems. In spite of this, we don't usually make mistakes, as I showed you, by that progression uh, to more and more and more definite ALS. And as I said, I think a cure to ALS is going to arise around the edges, probably in these familial cases. How big a problem is ALS? According to most people's statistics, uh, one to two people per 100,000 uh, get this disease every year. And it's pretty well uniform all around the world. Not a lot of variability. Because most people live maybe two to three years with the disease, you can say the prevalence and how many people at any point in time have the disease is about six to 10 per 100,000. So the incidence of this, there's many people that are getting this disease is get multiple sclerosis, for example, which is a much bigger disease. However, because so few people live 20 or 30 or 40 years, far fewer people have the disease in the community. Okay? It's a very slight male predominance. It's rare under 20. It's a little less common than sort of the extreme end of age. It's roughly uniform around the world with a couple of little wrinkles. And uh, I think I borrowed this from one of Mike Strong's uh, presentations or, or pictures, but the Age of onset, the average age of onset in most studies is around 57 for, for the sporadic disease, but 52 for familial disease. And if you want something to just hang on to, about half the people live about two years, about a fifth of five years, about a tenth of ten years, about a twentieth of twenty years. So just a little sort of a, a thing to, to, to sort of make it simpler for you. Older folks don't do as well as younger folks. Of course, you're better off getting the disease when you're older rather than dying when you're 25, uh, but you don't, you don't do quite as well. And as I've said before, limb onset versus bulbar onset, people with limb onset disease tend to do better than bulbar onset disease because you don't die because you've got a paralyzed foot. Okay? You die because you can't breathe. And the variability of ALS makes clinical trials difficult. So this a half, uh, two years, a fifth, and a twentieth, twenty years, etc. So you can see, even if we break this down, you'd think that people with definite ALS would have a much quicker downhill course than someone with sort of probable or, or uh, a possible ALS, and that's simply not the case as far as we can tell. So when I do an ALS history, partly because of that, there are certain things that you might focus on that are perhaps less emphasized in some other diseases. But some of them, the work and social history, the financial situation, the availability of insurance issues, the house, what type of house they live in, is it on one floor, is it accessible, is the washrooms accessible? And for most neurological diseases, we don't really care about that, because they're not an issue. In ALS, uh, they're hugely important. Um, I usually like to know how much people know when they come to see me in the clinic. Because I think if we're starting off with a, a different sort of uh, 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 understanding of what people know, so if I, if someone hasn't even been told that they have ALS, and I start telling them about, you know, the the impact of ALS, uh, that's not a good formula, right? So you like to know what they've been told, where they're coming from, um, and uh, again, you like to know whether they have any of the sort of difficulty with respiratory compromise. Uh, fatigue, uh, hypermetabolic state is actually quite common in ALS where people just progressively lose weight and we're not entirely sure why that is. Uh, physically exam, I don't think we need to emphasize that and investigations. Most people uh, do an MRI scan through the head and neck, uh, occasionally the whole cord and I think that's usually important if nothing else that put people's mind to rest that there's no other explanation that people have missed. We nearly always do an EMG because the EMG allows us to extend beyond the clinical exam alone vein atrophy for lower motor neuron features of uninvolved muscles. Do spirometry, blood work. Uh, and I always include Lyme and West Nile, even though I don't believe they're, they're important. Patients always like to know. They come back to you six months later or a year later and say, did you check my Lyme disease uh, spirometry? And sometimes even that's not enough, and we can maybe talk about that later, but uh, sometimes I'll do a lumbar puncture, but not very often. So, how do we treat ALS? Um, the treatments really break down into supportive treatments and specific treatments. Okay? 
So specific treatments, how do we understand this disease? Can I slow it down or can I stop it? And the supportive treatments are the things that this is the, the, what the patient has in terms of symptoms and signs. How best can we mitigate those symptoms and signs? And actually the supportive treatments are far more important in ALS than the specific treatments are. Now we'd all like to change that. We'd all like to have a specific treatment that would cure this disease. I would like nothing better than to be out of a job. But we're still a way away from that. So a, a typical sort of a, a, a complete ALS theme, so it could include a clinic coordinator, and then uh, a neurologist or a respirologist, a gastroenterologist, physiatrist, and palliative care. And if they're not on the team, at least they should be accessible in, in many. I, I think probably you're going to use all of those. A respiratory technologist, I think, is very important in an ALS team. And as well as an OT, speech language pathologist, a PT, specialized mobility and seating services, and social worker. The involvement of the regional ALS office is important because we have a, a, in Ontario an equipment pool which is essential for the patients. And then uh, volunteers and lab and research staff, I think, complete the sort of that team. Uh, for spasticity, uh, well, the corners again, this is not well treated. Uh, I don't think it's our fault that it's not well treated. It's just that we don't have a lot of good agents that can target spasticity without causing side effects so bad that most people would prefer to have the spasticity. So we use ben benzodiazepines or baclofen, Xanaflex, uh, but the side effects are uh, the, the drowsiness and the weakness are really limit them. And uh, sometimes you can use a uh, intrafecal infusion pump with baclofen, but again, there's some very significant payment issues for this in this province. Uh, stretching, physiotherapy uh, can be helpful, especially at night time, sometimes heat, cramping, uh, sometimes whining in their tongues or baclofen, and if people have urinary spasticity, some natural can help as well. Seating and mobility are, are important. You have to avoid falls. People fall, break an arm, break a hip. It takes them out of the home situation and puts them in an institution. Uh, energy conservation is important. Uh, people sometimes just get exhausted doing minimal amounts of exercise. And, and yes, exercise is good, but over-exercise is probably not that good. It sometimes takes people a day or two just to recover. Uh, to recover. So uh, things that are important to, to prevent people from falling, a cane or a walker, and then a wheelchair to try and preserve their, their energy. Access lifts to make their home accessible, wheelchair accessible vans, etc., etc., all very important. Speech language pathology, very important because the one thing that limits people in their enjoyment of this is their ability to communicate. So if they can't communicate, uh, in fact, as I point to later on, if I've got a second or two, that's the one thing that limits the, the use of our sort of uh, uh, permanent ventilation because people lose the ability to communicate and don't like to be kept alive without being able to interact with anybody else. Um, in North America, we don't do much uh, trade for permanent ventilation. Yeah, two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, and, but in Japan, they do. Uh, and what happens to ventilated patients? People stay alive, uh, but they still die as time goes by. And uh, they die usually of pneumonia. Okay, and this, uh, so I've just shown that there. But more important, uh, about uh, by five years out, about half of the people are unable to communicate or communicate reliably. And this is the one thing I think in North America that most turns most people away from permanent evolution.